is Jim Walker. I can't tell you how pleased we are to see you this evening. Welcome. Really happy to see you. Um, I'm a trustee of the Rupert J. Smith Law Library. I'm president of the Friends of the Rupert J. Smith Law Library. I'm a lawyer. I'm with the firm of Hayscar, Walker, Schwer, Dundas, and McCain. It is a privilege to be speaking with you here this evening, just briefly, in my capacity as Master of Ceremonies. A word to the wise, though. Let me give you a warning. You may have already picked up on this. I'm the slowest talking lawyer in town. I talk slow. I think slow. But the good news is you can keep up with me. You won't get behind. So um, if it seems like we're taking a little time to get to our destination, that's OK. I assure you. We will get there eventually. This is, the, this is the annual Law Day reception and art contest. The purpose of this proceeding is to celebrate the rule of law. There's really just one day of the year that's dedicated to that purpose. And when you think about it, the law is just intertwined with everything we do. In fact, there's a little quote by Abraham Lincoln that I'd like to share with you that I think maybe captures the essence of the law. Uh, Abraham Lincoln said this, let reverence for the law be breathed by every American mother to the lisping babe that prattles on her lap. Let it be taught in schools, in seminaries, and colleges. Let it be written in primers, spelling books, and in almanacs. Let it be preached from the pulpits, proclaimed in legislative halls, and in short, let it become the political religion of the nation. It is in that spirit that we convene today as we recall that the most sacred ideal of the law is that it affords equal justice to all. But without equal access to law, there can be no equal justice for all. And that's where law libraries come in. And that's one of the reasons that the Rupert J. Smith Law Library of St. Lucie County is so heavily involved in introducing the public to Law Day, because law is very important. People need to know that they can go to the law library to learn about law and to get access to it. And that way, each one of us, regardless of what our capacity to hire a lawyer, can obtain the information he or she needs about his rights, remedies, and obligations, and is able to function as a member of society. So, with that in mind, let me note here that our proceeding this evening is divided into two parts. Part one, that I am the master of ceremonies in is going to be recognizing individuals who through their accomplishments and their deeds exemplify the rule of law for all the rest of us here in the community. And I don't know about you, but it seems to me I've always thought that the saddest person there is is an unsung hero. If there's somebody who's doing something right, by golly, that person should be recognized. And that's what we try to do here with the Law law Day. So uh, this is what we're going to be doing as uh, part one. And then in uh, part two, uh, we're going to have the award recognition for our student artists whose works so well embody the 
annual theme for Law Day as chosen by the American Bar Association. In this case, this year's theme was free speech, free press, and free society. You'll be hearing more about that. The Master of Ceremonies for Part 2 will be Carlos Wells. We couldn't do this without the assistance and support of our sponsors. We really want to uh, single them out and to thank them expressly. The uh, Port St. Lucie Bar Association has been very supportive. The St. Lucie County Bar Association has been very generous in its support. We want to thank them uh, there's Everlovin Associates. It's a statewide corporation that serves law libraries. If you've had an opportunity to check out that wonderful uh, uh, collection of uh, materials in back, uh, you can thank Everlovin Associates. They just did a wonderful job with that. And if you haven't, nobody's going to arrest you if you sneak back there at this point and get something uh, and maybe, who knows, you won't even need to worry about dinner. Uh, but uh, Everlove uh, and Associates just did a wonderful job for us, and we appreciate that. Uh, also, uh, uh, Judge Ben L. Bryan was a very important uh, sponsor, and we want to thank him as well. Uh, we certainly want to uh, thank and recognize the wonderful people of the school board who are with us here tonight. Uh, it was great that they were able to be here, and it is a very impressive testimonial of their commitment on behalf of students that they are here to show their support. And I think that speaks so well of them. What I'd like to do with their permission, we don't want to put anybody on the spot, if, but if, as I just uh, bring up your name, if you could just briefly Stand and nod, that would be appreciated. There's uh, Catherine uh, Hensley. Nice, nice to have you. And there's uh, Franny Hutchinson. <laughs> County Commissioner Hutchinson has been with us a long time. There's Debbie Hawley. Thank you for your support that you exhibit by your presence tonight for our very talented students. Um, there are others that you're going to be introduced here to tonight in the course of the evening. I've got to share with you a sense of how incredibly impressed uh, I have been with these people. You, you try to get familiar with their record a little bit. Uh, knowing you'll be introducing them and uh, uh, listening to them. And I've got to tell you, these are sharp, impressive people. So I would encourage you to give them your attention uh, when they uh, get up here and speak and, and come before you. It's uh, very exciting to have uh, people like that uh, joining us here this evening. So. What we're going to be doing now is commencing the ceremony for this evening with the Honorable Burton Connor. I'd like to tell you a little bit about Judge Connor before he actually comes up, however, so you'll have some insight into him. I think it's very helpful. After that, he's going to be speaking a little bit about the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. He's also told me he wants to weave in a little bit about Law Day on that as well. Judge Connor um, graduated from the University of Florida Law School about a year after I did. Um, and he has filled just about every possible box in the profession. Uh, that a, a lawyer can occupy before now sitting on one of the most distinguished seats in the judiciary. Judge uh, Connor started out after he graduated 
by going to the, uh, the public defender's office, and he uh, served there a number of years, and then he became uh, a uh, assistant state's attorney, served there a number of years. Um, I will add that he practiced many years in private practice in Okeechobee. In addition to serving the public defender's office and the state attorney's office, Judge uh, Connor served uh, a year on special assignment to the U.S. attorney's office. After he was a county judge in Okeechobee, he left and went back into private practice for a little bit, but then he became a circuit court judge. And for the benefit of our younger people here, a circuit court judge is a judge of unlimited jurisdiction. That means they hear most of the cases that um, you read about in the paper, except the smaller ones which come under the heading of the county court. And then uh, after serving as a circuit court judge, Judge Connor became a district court judge, and he is now on the fourth district court of appeals. That's down in West Palm. And uh, the way that fits into the grand scheme of things here is that if somebody has a trial here in St. Lucie County or, or anywhere in Indian River, St. Lucie, Okeechobee, um, West Palm Beach, uh, criminal, civil, any kind of trial, and they're not satisfied with the results, they can always appeal. And in our part of the state, that appeal goes down to West Palm Beach at the 4th District Court of Appeal, and Judge Connor sits among the panels that hears those cases. So when a man of his distinction is willing and able to come and help us open this proceeding and tell us a little bit about the Pledge of Allegiance and what it means, that really is something that we're very grateful for. Your Honor. First of all, Mr. Walker, I want to thank you and the Rupert J. Smith, law, friends of the Rupert J. Smith Law Library for inviting me to attend this reception tonight and also to make a few comments about the pledge before we uh, recite that. Um, however, uh, I'm going to make the intro a little bit shorter by explaining I'm just a simple, common, everyday guy and I live in Fort Pierce, okay? <laughs> um, as Mr. Walker mentioned, since 1950, May 1st has been celebrated across the country as Law Day. And of course, our flag and the Pledge of Allegiance stands for a lot of things. I've said many times that, for me, the Pledge of Allegiance represents the three great pillars that are the foundation of what I contend is the greatest republic of all times, this country. The rule of law, a strong and independent judiciary, and the right to a trial by jury. But I have a core belief that action always speaks louder than words. And even though those three pillars I just mentioned are an example of action, I've also come to understand that words are the building blocks of ideas. And it's the sharing of ideas that develops knowledge. And as Mr. Walker mentioned, the theme for Law Day this year is free speech, free press, and free society. And it's true that without free speech and without a free press, we cannot have a free society. And we're very fortunate tonight to have a lot of young people in this room. And it's critically important that parents and teachers help our children to and our youth to understand the importance of words <clears throat> and the importance of exchanging different ideas. And it's also extremely important that we teach them what the flag and the Pledge of Allegiance represents. We should also remember that the Pledge of Allegiance is a very simple way that all of us 
can express appreciation to the men and women in the military who over the course of our history have died, suffered injury, or sacrificed being with their families and friends in order to protect this great nation. And as we sit in the comfort of this room tonight, we need to remember there are men and women in the military putting their lives on the line to protect us. All the words to the pledge are extremely important, but I would contend the last three words are the most important, justice for all, because we really can't have liberty for all unless we practice and put into action justice for all. So ladies and gentlemen, we have the freedom of speech, and if you're inclined to do so, I'd ask that you please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We're going to have our keynote speaker introduced here, but it seems to me that uh, you should know something about the individual who is going to be introducing our keynote speaker. And the reason that I say that is that it's very important to us that um, those who speak, those who are honored here this evening, uh, understand the full Gratif uh, gravitas, the full measure of gratitude that is felt for everything that they have done. And one of the ways that we try to do that is to ask people who are equally as distinguished to introduce them. And that is certainly the case with our keynote speaker that you're about to meet here. And our, uh, our federal magistrate judge, Shaniac Maynard, was asked to introduce him. Now, I've got to tell you, when I read the material on Judge Maynard, I was a little overwhelmed here. Um, we're just really lucky to have people like her in our area. She is a classic case of hometown girl who made good. And I, for one, am just so proud of her success in our profession. Uh, does anyone here go to Westwood High School? No? OK. Well, Westwood is a well-known uh, school here in St. Lucie County. Judge uh, Maynard graduated from Westwood uh, high school in 1994 and she's grown up in this area and she went through uh, our local uh, school system after uh, she graduated from uh, West uh, Westwood High School she went to Howard University and from Howard University she went to Yale Law School and after she got out of Yale Law School she taught there in Washington, D.C. for uh, about five years. She uh, worked with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund as a civil rights advocate. She worked with the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division. Um, after that, she was a uh, 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 federal prosecutor with the U.S. Attorney's Office. She um, prosecuted uh, crimes involving um, human trafficking, civil rights, narcotics, white collar fraud. We, the residents of the Treasure Coast area, benefited from a subsequent decision that she made to come back into the local area. And she was the executive director of the Round Table of St. Lucie County. And in the course of that work, she's, she worked closely with young people, um, young men in gangs, helping them to get into school, stay in school, find jobs. Um, she uh, worked with teens and students at 
Kids at Hope and Youth Leadership. In other words, she focused on all the nuts and bolts that make this a meaningful human community that we live in that is just so important. After that, she was appointed as the federal magistrate judge for the United States Southern District Court here in Florida. She uh, works at the federal courthouse in downtown Fort Pierce. And um, uh, she provide, uh, presides over cases in the entire 19th Circuit, which is Indian River, um, Martin County, St. Lucie, Okeechobee, and also in uh, Highlands County as well. She has had a very distinguished career. And like I said, we're really proud that a, a hometown girl has accomplished all these things. That's kind of cool. So uh, with her permission, I will call her forward to introduce our keynote speaker. Good evening. It is my honor to introduce you to your keynote speaker for to this evening. But before I do that, I just want to encourage all the students here and all the parents and families because growing up in St. Lucie County, you know, I remember participating in programming just like this. I remember I decided to become a lawyer because I was participating in the teen court program at the 19th Judicial Circuit Courthouse. And I was in high school at Westwood, and there was an attorney named Mickey McMantry who would take us high schoolers down there, and we would play the role of a prosecutor or a defense attorney or jurors. And I remember sitting in that beautiful courthouse and thinking, I could do this one day. Like, I could be this type of attorney. And I remember realizing that that's in the courtroom, in our justice system, is really where anyone can have a voice. So I just want to encourage the students, encourage the parents to keep at it, participate in all the wonderful programs that our county has to offer. And the sky is the limit for each and every one of our students in St. Lucie County. So with that, let me turn to introducing your keynote speaker. It's um, my privilege to introduce to you the Honorable Judge Michael J. Lynn of the 19th Judicial Circuit of Florida. He serves in Indian River County, where he hears cases involving juvenile dependency and delinquency and probate and guardianship. He was appointed by Governor Rick Scott, and he took the bench in January of this year. Judge Lynn was born in Cross Lanes, West Virginia, and his family moved to Pensacola, Florida when he was 10 years old. So let me ask, do I have any 10-year-olds in here? Okay, so it was about your age when his family moved to Florida. Now, he went to high school at Pen Pensacola Christian Academy, where he played baseball. Any students in here like to play baseball? You like baseball? Raise your hand. Oh, I see a few. See a few. Okay. He also was in the band. So anybody here play an instrument? Okay. And he also played golf. Anybody here likes to play golf? All right. So, see, we all have a lot in common with Judge Lynn. Okay. After graduating from high school, he went to the University of West Florida, where he majored in political science. And after graduating from college, he earned his law degree at the University of Florida. So I just want to say, I have noticed here today that we've heard from Attorney Walker, who went to University of Florida, Judge Connor, who went to University of Florida, and Judge Lynn went to University of Florida. So I don't know about anybody else in here, but I'm kind of thinking about sending my kids to University of Florida. <laughs> Judge Lynn was admitted to practice law in Florida in 2005. He was hired as an assistant state attorney uh, by State Attorney Bruce Colton here at the 19th Ju uh, Judicial Circuit, and he served as a prosecutor for 13 years. He served as a felony trial attorney. He assisted in prosecuting several first-degree homicide cases, and he was also the supervisor in um, for county court, where he trained new attorneys, handled domestic violence cases, and assisted in prosecuting DUI manslaughter cases. So that's the official background on Judge Lynn. 
Now, in preparation for today, I called Judge Lynn on the phone, and I did one of the things that I do best, which is ask a lot of questions. I wanted to get to know him so I could give you guys the real scoop on Judge Lynn. So one of the questions I asked him was, when did he know he wanted to be a lawyer, and why? And he told me that when he was in high school, he initially wanted to go into politics. But then he interned for a judge, uh, Judge Michael Jones in Pensacola. And when he worked for Judge Michael Jones, he realized that he could have even more of an impact in his community as a judge. He learned from Judge Jones, who he described as a very humble individual, that the number one thing is making a difference in your community and helping people. And he realized that, realized that judges help their community by being willing to make the tough decisions needed to get the cases and controversies through the system. And that really resonated with me, because I've been on the bench now for about two years. And there are a lot of days that I have to make really tough decisions. And I kind of like wish, like, oh, maybe some, I could call somebody and maybe they could just make this decision. But it is really true that judges make the really tough decisions that help our society keep moving forward. And so that was one of the reasons that he decided he wanted to go into the law. I also asked Judge Lynn, what does he view about being the hardest thing about being a judge? And he said the hardest thing so far for him is when he has to terminate a parent's rights to their child in dependency court. He said that's really difficult. Um, at the same time, he said the most rewarding thing for him is when he gets to pre preside over adoption day, which is when he sees children who have been neglected or abused being adopted, finding their forever home and their forever family where they'll find love. He also loves to see kids graduating from the drug court program. After completing that program, many of them have set goals for themselves, gained the tools to be successful in life, and they have a good shot at never coming back to the system. So what's the personal scoop on Judge Lynn? All right. Judge Lynn and his wife are residents of Port St. Lucie, and his wife is named Sarah. And they are the proud parents of their 18-year-old son, Angel, who is a graduating senior at Port St. Lucie High School and is also receiving his Associates of Arts degree from Indian River State College through the dual enrollment program. So it is my pleasure to present to some and introduce to others the Honorable Michael J. Lynn. Thank you. Um, I promise I will do my best to keep this as keep this brief, make a few points and keep it brief, um, because I know we all want to get to the money, right? I mean, that's, that's why we're here, right? Um, I, I also teach at Indian River State College. I teach in the criminal justice program there. So I kind of want to make today, um, you know, for about 10 minutes or so, a little bit of an interactive uh, 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 presentation, if you will. So I'm going to ask for audience participation. I figured I had some students here. So I'll see if I can get them to respond to some things, so we, and then we'll keep moving and get on to the award ceremony later. I, I do have to say, uh, I've, I've known Jim for several years now, and having grown up in, well, being born in West Virginia, I did, there was a brief stint, I lived in, in South Georgia and then Northwest Florida up in Pensacola. You know, Jim says he talks slow, but where I grew up, that's kind of the normal pace of speaking. So I, I don't really know what he's, he's talking about. But I have a photograph. And I wasn't given a really good estimate of how many people were here. So I've got about 30 pictures. And what I'd like to do is pass this out. I want you guys to take a look at this photograph. And, um, and you're going to have to share it with some people. And, and you don't mind uh, giving me a hand. And then um, if you just uh, just take a couple on a row and, and, and pass it back. And I want, I want you guys to take a look at that photograph because the, the, the theme is free speech, free society, and free press. And then, and then um, I, I want you guys to, to, to take a look at that and think about what you see in that photograph. Okay. What do you see in that photograph? It's a good. 
You do. You see Mr. Kennedy, right? Yes, ma'am. People making presentations. People making presentations, okay? And, and what is, and knowing that we're talking about free speech and people making presentations, is that an example of free speech? Yes. Yeah, yeah, it is. What else do you see? What other freedoms do you see being exercised in that photograph? Racial equality. Yeah. You see racial equality. Actually, in, in that case, in, in that photograph, Mr. Kennedy is speaking to the Congress of Racial Equality Group. Um, they're one of the, the, the first and, and leading groups in uh, the civil rights movement back in the 60s. So what else, what other freedoms do you see being exercised in that photograph? Freedom to assemble. You see the freedom to assemble. Very good, right? You got a group of people there and, and, and they were they were assembling freely. What what other? There's a, you gotta look at some of the details. What are some of those people doing in the crowd? Yeah. Somebody said it. Free press. Freedom of the press, yeah. right? You yeah. see the you see the people holding up the microphones, having, you know, get reporters there listening to what Mr. Kennedy says so they can then go on and report so the people in America can know what's going on. And we, we think, you know, we, we value our press, correct? Mm -hmm. Right? Well, some of us value some press, some of us value other press. You know, press can be very biased, but, you know, that, that kind of thing. You know, you turn on CNN, you think the country's going to heck, and you turn on Fox News and you think we're, we're you know, the greatest country that's ever walked on the face of the earth. Where's the truth? You know, and that, that's up for you all to decide, right? Because you all have these freedoms, the freedom to speak, the freedom to think, right? The freedom to talk about these ideas, read the newspaper. I honestly don't watch news anymore. Um, but that's the, the, the opportunity you all have on a day-to-day -day basis. So what, what does the freedom of speech mean to you? What does it mean to you? Yes, ma'am. It means everyone has a voice. Why is it important that everyone has a voice? Well, because if only a couple of people have a voice, then there would be no change and there would be very biased. Right. If only, the, and I don't know if you've heard that. Let me repeat that. That is a great point. She said, if only a couple of people get to speak, then there will be, right, no change, right? And everyone will be exposed to this bias. That's, that's very, very good. Very good. What, what does it mean to you? Freedom, freely expressing your opinion, okay? And why is it important to freely express your, your opinion? For new ideas. For new ideas, right? We, don't, we grow as a country with new ideas. And, and we learn things. And we, when we see problems in society, um, we go to Tallahassee and maybe Pat try to pass a law, right? Right? And change things. Right? Because we, you know, um, what else? What does the freedom of speech mean to you all? Anybody else? Freedom to speak, freedom to have ideas, to learn, to grow. All of those things are, are, are very important. So, um, now, the freedom to assemble and the freedom of press. What, the freedom of press, let's talk about that. Why is that important? Why is that important? No one knows. Everybody's like, oh my God, you know, the news is all bad news. I don't know. Yes, why is that important? To let people share their opinions. To let people share their opinions, right? To know what is going on and you can form an opinion and you can think freely in this country, right? What, what else? Any other ideas of why freedom of press is important? Yes, sir? To, to inform the community, people. Right. To, and to inform everyone to know what's going on. And why is that important in a free society to know what's going on? Do something about it if you need to make changes. What's that? Do something about it if you want to make a change. Right. Do something about it. Mm -hmm. Like what, what is, what is, what's Mr. Kennedy, what's, what's Robert Kennedy doing in that photograph? He's doing something about it, right? He's doing something about it. So that, that's why we have these freedom, this freedom of speech and this freedom of press in our country today. It is a very, very important freedom. So we know what's going on. You know, you can read about what your judges are doing every once in a while in the newspaper. The newspaper will be in the courtroom and they'll, they'll report on us and you'll see what's, what's going on. Because, because some, at the state level, 
you're going to decide if you want to keep us as judges. And part of that is you're going to want to read about us and find out what, you know, what it is that we do on a daily basis. You know, are we reckless with our decision making or are we reasonable and we work hard and that kind of thing. And, and so and then you're going to talk about each other. You can talk about your leaders in your community, your legislative bodies and that and that type of thing. So all of this is, is goes to our core as Americans, right? We're all allowed to have an opinion, and we're all, all allowed to make a stand, and we're all allowed to try and change things. And we wouldn't have that if it wasn't for the fact that we have a free speech and, and free press. Now, um, let me... Let me do this, because I, I, I want to talk about a couple, one, one other point, and then I'll conclude my remarks so we can get to the awards, right? <laughs> That's the goal here? All right, so I'm going to read to you, the, you know, I'll carry the Constitution around with me, and, and, I, I, and I will encourage young people, because I teach at Indian River State College, and first of all, it scares me how poorly United States history is taught anymore. But second of all, I'm in a law class, and I go into my class, and I, and I ask my students, have you read the Constitution? Have you read the United States Constitution? You know, you're here in a law class. You, need, you know, you're an American, for Pete's sake. Have you read the Constitution? And maybe one person raises their hand. Maybe two people raise their hand in the class. I can tell you this. In my class, by the end of class, everybody's read the United States Constitution. And in fact, and still answer a lot of questions about it. So they know that this is the document that ultimately we all are under as United States citizens. This is the document that provide us with the freedoms that we have as an American and go to the very core of what we are as an American. And, and it, you know, it's very important to me because, it, um, you know, I have, and, and many of you have veterans in your, in your, in your family, right? have yeah, veterans, and they, they've been willing to sacrifice their life for this. And, and it's something that I'm very humbled as a judge every day to walk in and know that, you know, my job is also to police these cases to make sure in, that they are in compliance with the Constitution and make sure that people's rights aren't being violated on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's something I'm very humbled to be able to do um, since I've taken the bench. But here's the, here's the First Amendment. And Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. And that's one thing, when you take a look at that picture, what do you think the, the group of people is about to do? That very last sentence, right? petition the government for a redress of grievances, which eventually led us to the Civil Rights Act, correct? I mean, I mean the people like, like Mr. Kennedy and the, the group of the Congress of uh, Racial Equality and those that were leading in the, in the Civil Rights Movement, they were able to bring about a tremendous amount of change here in our country in the 60s. And it was all because they had the freedom of speech. But I've read to you this, and, and the freedom of speech is very important in other countries as well. And this leads up to my, my final point. The freedom of, of speech also appears in other constitutions of other nations in the world. And I want to read to you um, what one constitution says. It's in Article 67 of this constitution. And it says, citizens are guaranteed freedom of the press, of assembly, demonstration and association. Does that sound good? It sounds good, right? You got freedom of the press, you can associate, um, you, can, you can demonstrate, you can assemble. All of that sounds very good. Sounds very familiar to our freedom of speech, right? Sounds great. How many of you, that, anybody want to give a guess of what constitution I just read from? Canada, somebody said Canada, it's a good guess. Where? England, good. that's a guess. Somebody said Venezuela, wrong, okay. but not too far off. 
It's not Russia. You're getting close. That is from the Constitution of North Korea. It's from the Constitution of North Korea. So, and I, and I kind of want to end on this point. Why, why is their Constitution, which says these nice things, why is it completely different than our Constitution, than how we have our freedom of speech here in America? Why do you think? Because they don't practice, they don't practice what they preach. They don't practice what they preach. They don't and more, have judges. What's that? They don't, have judges. they don't have judges, right? They don't have judges like Judge Connor, like myself, like Judge Maynard, that, that, that have, that, that can, that, and why? Why? What's the difference between, well, they do have judges, but what's the difference between their judges and, and our judges? What happens if their judge disagrees with, with Kim Jong-un? Death. Death, right? Death. So who really is the judge in North Korea? It's their leader. And, and I, and I want to end on this. Why we are Americans, and what, probably what it, the most critical thing that, I, and I teach this in my college classes, and I think it's overlooked constantly, um, almost every time. Why we have these freedoms and we're able to preserve these freedoms is frankly because we have an independent judiciary, right? Like I, I, I can make a decision and guess what? The worst thing that's gonna happen to me, well there's a couple of bad things, but one of the worst things that could happen to me is when Judge Connor's reviewing my decision, he says, you know what, Judge Lynn, you came up with the wrong decision, we're gonna reverse you and you're gonna have to comply with the law. Okay, that's the worst thing. The other worst thing is you could vote, you know, I, I could lose my job. But, <laughs> the, but, um, but that's neither here nor there. The, uh, so, but that's really the worst thing. Okay, we have an independent judiciary. We also vote for people to write the law. Right? I don't get to write the law. I mean, you saw Commissioner Hudson, it's in Commissioner Parts is here. You know, they write ordinances. I don't get to write the ordinances here. You vote for these individuals to write the law. My job is simply to interpret it if it's ambiguous. That's all my job is. And then you have an executive branch that's also independent. It is the separation of powers. It's that diffusion of power that brings it closer to the people. And people call, you know, complain about gridlock in America and gridlock in our government. And that's exactly how our founding fathers set up our government, is to have that, dis that diffusion. So the First Amendment actually means something here. We have individuals that aren't going to be executed if they violate. So it's not, it's not what's, you know, it, back in colonial times, um, what they would consider Article 67 of the North Korean um, um, Constitution, they would consider that what's called a parchment promise, meaning it's written down, but it means absolutely nothing. Okay, so, and, and, but here, our freedom of speech means something, and it's because of the separation of powers. So, and, and we have this separation of powers, which is also critical for the freedom of press, right? So our freedom of press can inform you so you can vote for the correct people to give the power to. So um, it has been my honor to serve, and, and frankly, it's been my honor to, to, uh, to be introduced by Judge Maynard. I, I frankly, um, and it, it's incredible if you get the opportunity to meet her. She's an incredible public servant in this community. Um, judge Connor, I was uh, a very young felony attorney, and he was my first trial judge, and a tremendous, you know, I wish, wish you all could see him in action, and you could if you go down to the fourth DCA, but he is an incredible judge, a very humble individual. Also, Judge Eisenhower just slipped in the back. He was at one time my supervisor at the state attorney's office and also my landlord, so I don't know if he's here. <laughs> he's here to pick up an old rent check or something but but anyhow I appreciate your time um, tonight I hope I've challenged you all in some way and you young people keep up the good work okay keep on this path and always be thinking and always be thankful for the freedom that you have and why you have the freedom that you have so thank you all very much Roscoe Pell was one of the greatest legal thinkers and educators uh, of the 20th century. And for 20 years, he 
kept at the helm uh, as dean of uh, Harvard Law School. He served in uh, equally distinguished capacities for the remainder of a 94-year life. And uh, one of the things that he did was to deliver a series of lectures at Dartmouth College in 1921. And this was talking about um, uh, Professor Pound's philosophy of the, the law, the common law. Uh, the uh, name of that lecture series was The Spirit of the Common Law. Uh, Roscoe Pound was one of the early leaders of the movement for what was called American Legal Realism. And uh, that's uh, a school which argues for a more pragmatic and public interested interpretation of law and a focus on how the legal process actually occurs, as opposed to what he viewed as the, what was the phrase, the arid legal formalism of the law. In any case, his lectures were put down in the form of writing in a book that has come to be known as one of the great classics of American legal literature. This particular volume um, is the first edition, first print, 1921, so I guess that makes it about 19, uh, 98 years old. And it is a privilege, sir, to present this to you in warmest thanks for your Thank you so service here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. The Honorable Linda Bartz is going to be introducing our next speaker here this evening, our, uh, our honoree who will be honored as she will be telling us for his contributions here in the community on behalf of the rule of law. Um, Linda Bartz is the chair of the Board of County Commissioners. She is an extraordinary lady. We are happy that she is willing to serve in this capacity here tonight to help us underscore to our honoree the importance of the award that he will be receiving here this evening. Linda Bartz is the quintessence of a faithful public servant. She and her husband have been living here in Port St. Lucie for 30 years. They have three grown daughters. She started out as a councilwoman in Port St. Lucie in 2006, serving District 1. And then in 2010, she was the vice mayor there in Port St. Lucie. And along the way, she learned how to balance a budget and manage money. And uh, she, uh, uh, for uh, areas of interest in policy here on the Treasure Coast, she identifies special concerns about um, traffic and roads and ensuring that the emergency access vehicles can get back and forth from hospitals and the like quickly. She uh, believes in working uh, closely with um, members of the school board and the um, uh, district to assure that legal educational standards are kept high. She's a strong believer in that. And uh, she uh, dedicates herself to maintaining for those of us who live here in St. Lucie County as high a standard of living and quality of life as she can possibly assure through her own service. Um, I counted down a list of boards and committees that she's on. <laughs> uh, I, I, I stopped at 15, but that gives you an idea of how deeply embedded she is in our community. 
Happily, she is also one of the five trustees for our RJS Law Library, so we're in assured of having a very involved, very committed member of that uh, board for the benefit of our law library. Um, I uh, looked at a list of the other organizations she's uh, involved with, but um, Judge uh, Lynn did make a point of noting that sometime this evening we've got to get to these uh, awards, so I'm not going to attempt to list all the groups that she has been involved with. It is considerable. We're very happy that Commissioner Bartz has graciously agreed to introduce one of our honorees this evening. Thank you. So he was just supposed to say Linda Bartz is here to introduce somebody. <laughs> That's what it was supposed to be. So I want to take a moment to tell you that I'm going to introduce somebody who last week I didn't know. Strangely enough, we had a meeting this week. So I am really, really pleased to introduce him. George Shoplin, he is the new director of New Horizons. Covers four counties, I have that right? It's a four county nonprofit provider of things that are near and dear to me, mental health and substance use recovery services. They've welcomed them him to their board. I tried hard to welcome you to the community the other day. Um, I am honored that they have brought you here. We will work hard to move you here. <laughs> so, George is an accomplished healthcare executive with both local and national experience in leading programs that help adults and children coping with mental health challenges and substance abuse. He holds a bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Delaware and a master's degree in counseling psychology from Temple University in Philadelphia. No UF here, Shanique. <laughs> Most recently, George served as the director of the Institute for Mental Health at St. Mary's Medical Center in West Palm Beach. There, he was responsible for all clinical, operational, and financial aspects of the program, as well as community education and integration with other providers. I know there was a nationwide search that went on to find someone who could replace a gentleman who had been there for 30 years, John Romano. I think that we all felt that those were going to be tough shoes to fill. I was not on that search committee, but I would applaud anybody who was on that search committee because they've done a good job. We have a man here who works in every aspect of mental health and substance abuse. I don't think that there is any job that he will not take on himself if necessary. And I think that Along with mental health and substance abuse, I have to tell you that what impressed me the most was your love for children. And we all know in this community, our children are our future, and we must, we must invest in them. And we do that every day. We have the school board in the back. Thank you so much for you, what you do with our children. Um, I am proud and honored to introduce George Shoplin.
Thank you, Commissioner. Um, with that introduction, I have, I have to do a pretty good job here, right? Um, I have had the, the opportunity to work 32 years in mental health. Um, that encompasses my entire professional career. This has been my personal and professional passion. Um, my career started when I was 18 years old. Um, and I was in, getting ready to go to college and I wanted to know what I wanted to do. And my mother um, went back to school after my parents were divorced and got her degree in psychology and worked in family court. And I was young, I was 10, and I went, that's interesting. And I started working in the field, and I realized what the field really was. It's an opportunity to touch people. It's an opportunity to change somebody's life course. And not many of us have positions where you can actually go on a daily basis and say, I impacted somebody's life. I turned them from here to there. Recently, I said a new employer orientation, and I meet our new employees at New Horizons, and I speak to them. And what I say is you have four or five aha moments a year. And these aha moments are those points where you have touched somebody and you know it. You know that you've forced somebody's life to be improved. That they will look back and say, it was that moment, that conversation, that minute, that reassurance, that really good introduction <laughs> that turned them and allowed them to have a changed course. And that they need to grasp those four or five opportunities, hold them close, hold them there, those hard days, those tough days, and understand that's the value of the work we do in mental health. My 32 years has been in multiple states. Um, I've been fortunate to work in Northeast and here in Florida. In that time, I've worked in multiple programs, held multiple positions. I've interacted with amazing people, amazing clients, amazing staff, amazing mentors. And there are lessons, many, many lessons I've learned. But I think one of the most important lessons that you learn is that the rights and freedoms of mentally ill can be easily discarded, disregarded, or marginalized. The vulnerable population, the group of people who can be easily steered and lack some control of their influence. And it is our obligation, our duty as professionals to preserve and hold sacred those rights and freedoms because they are people. And yet those people at times do not have the capacity to do those things necessary and find the balance between what is our necessary intervention to limit those freedoms and rights, and then what are their rights and freedoms that should be raised fully. And that is the challenge that we all face. But it's an endeavor we all have to engage in. I am fortunate because I'm the president and CEO of New Horizons of the Treasure Coast. Um, it is an organization that has been in our community for 60 years. Over those six years, they have helped hundreds of thousands of community members. It is a wonderful organization that serves all four counties. They treat people in their homes, in their schools, in their churches, and in facilities you run across the county. I am also blessed because this organization is staffed by a group of people who are passionate, committed, and most importantly, humble in the work they do in helping those who need help in our community and Treasure Coast. And I use the word humble very intentionally. I've been with New Horizons a very short period of time, and what has caught me is the expertise within the organization that I am blessed to have worked for me. And they have no idea how good they are. They have no idea the skills they have, the impact they have on the community. And yet I look at what they do every day, and I am impressed. And I am pleased and I am proud to represent them in situations like this. This staff, every day, strives to preserve those rights of the people we serve. Strives to keep their freedoms intact and allow them to move forward and make those aha moments to steer those life courses in the right direction. But what can we do? What is our obligation to those people? What we need to recognize is that mental illness is something that impacts all of us. It impacts us personally, impacts our family, impacts our society, our communities. And because of that, we need to have that sensitivity to the fact that people who suffer and need help from facilities like mine are not much different than any of us. We all face stresses. Many of us are sitting right now under a degree of stress and hardship. 
the things that we're facing. And the only difference between those people that need care or mindful type of facilities and the rest of us are the circumstances they face themselves in. And if we are sensitive to the fact that these are just people in our community whose circumstances are such that they need some additional help, then we can approach helping them in a different way. We can welcome them into our community in a different way. Uh, and in ending, in one of the facilities I've worked in in New Jersey, a nice gentleman named Mike Tolino, an older Italian gentleman with striking blue eyes, that when you looked at him, he just grabbed you. He just grabbed you and you had to listen to him. He leaned in one day and he said, George, they're people, just like us. And the minute you lose sight of that, is the minute you stop being effective. Never lose sight of the fact that they're just people like us. I appreciate this. I appreciate all your time and opportunity in the Congress. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you very much. For a lifetime spent in service to the rule of law through devotion to community and people, presented to George Shockman, New Horizons of the Treasure Coast in grateful thanks and appreciation by the friends of the Rupert J. Smith Law Library of St. Lucie County. It's my honor. We've been uh, fortunate to have the services of our law librarian since 1992. Probably a few more years than we'd like to think about, but the Law Library has benefited immensely from her involvement and her sustained commitment over those many years. And Nora Everlove, the Law Librarian, has very kindly and graciously consented to make the next award. Thank you. It's wonderful to see you. Uh, welcome. Um, I'm here to acknowledge and thank Mike Fowler for the gifts he has made to the Rupert J. Smith Law Library. Mike was a Vietnam era naval aviator and before he attended law school. And he has practiced tax and estate planning law for the last 40 years. He is what's referred to as AV rated, which means his peers have selected him and they're saying his legal expertise is as good as it gets. He is not just a good lawyer, he's a great guy. He has supported us uh, in many ways, but he's also supported other nonprofit and charitable organizations in our community. Many of them are um, to help the aging and the aged. <laughs> so I want to tell you briefly that a law library needs three things to be successful. First, it needs a wonderful collection of materials to help the patrons find the answers that they're seeking. Secondly, it needs a great staff <laughs> to help those patrons get the most out of the resources in the library. And thirdly, it needs a good agenda of programs. And at the Rupert J. Smith Law Library, we have many workshops and seminars to help everyone, particularly the general public. But we also have one for attorneys. We have a monthly continuing legal education seminar that's held over a lunch hour. And um, it is free to the participants. Well, it's free to everyone but, but Mike Fowler because <laughs> he has underwritten these programs for three years, three years. And uh, has borne the major expense that uh, we've had in giving these seminars. So that makes him the single largest donor, individual donor to the law library in 30 years. Yes. <laughs> I cannot thank him 
them enough. The program has doubled in size, in part because of his support. He is a wonderful man <laughs> and a wonderful friend. I have a plaque. What would, what would we be without plaques? <laughs> and it says, for his steadfast support of legal education, presented to Michael Fowler, Esquire, given in hand on this day of May 2nd, 2019, in grateful thanks and appreciation by the trustees of the Rupert J. Smith Law Library of St. Lucie County. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you. Thank you so much for honoring me and for providing the example that made it so easy for me to give back to the law library. I'm just so impressed by Jim and Nora's efforts to support the library, and I'm so glad to give back to a profession that has been good to me and to help support the rule of law. Thank you. Mr. Carlos Wells will be introducing our final honoree this evening. Mr. Wells pleaded with me to keep it as short as I possibly could and giving you a little bit of background about Carlos and I will honor that pledge. Nevertheless, it is necessary that you be aware that Mr. Wells is um, Assistant State's Attorney. He uh, serves in the juvenile division there as a senior associate. Uh, Mr. Wells, in addition to his extensive service with the State's Attorney's Office, served, I want to say it was for about eight years, with the Public Defender's Office and acquired senior status there. So he has served with distinction in the service of the public um, through his involvement. We're quite happy to uh, have uh, him here this evening to handle the introduction. Uh, I would like to share something with you, though, that I think is especially uh, interesting. Has anybody ever seen that movie, The Paper Chase? I didn't really expect any hands. That goes back a ways. And that was about uh, law school. And, and that tells us that law school's a full-time job. Well, not only did Carlos Wells graduate from Villanova Law School in Philadelphia, but while he was doing that, before and after, he was in the United States Army Reserves with the Armor Branch uh, as a captain. Personally, I just find that so impressive to know that he was serving our country while he was additionally going through law school. If you think about that, that's remarkable. So with that, uh, I want to thank uh, Mr. Wells for serving this evening in handling the introduction of our next honoree. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a truly an honor to be here, but the greatest honor is to introduce the next um, honoree, uh, Officer Danny de Tri Center. Um, just want to let you know, um, when I first came to the juvenile division here in St. Lucie County, back in about 2009, um, Danny Dry Center um, was one of the first officers um, to ultimately introduce herself to me, and um, I really got to know her over my career. Um, she's very passionate about juvenile law. Um, kind of, she was like a teammate member, and, and the, the, if anyone knows anything about juvenile law, it's a challenging field. There's a lot of restrictions, there's a lot of things we can't do. I get told more times in court about what I can't do versus what I can, and it's quite challenging. And over the years, Danny has um, really dedicated herself and educated me, educated me about the youth in the community, um, and she's helped me do a, a much better job and pointed 
all the areas that I needed to focus my attention as a prosecutor here in St. Lucie County. Um, she's born and raised in uh, West Berlin, Germany, and uh, is bilingual. And she came here in approximately uh, 2000 in April. Uh, and ultimately made a home in Port St. Lucie, moving after moving back and forth between Germany. Um, she started off as a civilian duty officer. Um, she, in that capacity, she realized that there was a more of a greater need to um, provide interventions to our at-risk youth here in St. Lucie County, specifically Fort Pierce area. And then um, she decided to become a law enforcement officer. Uh, that's a process of going through school, additional schooling, education, training, and uh, after, t and uh, she did. She obtained her certification in law enforcement and became a police officer. After two years on the road patrol, um, she, I, I applaud her, made a pitch to the then Chief uh, Savage, uh, explaining the need for somebody to uh, be able to work with our at-risk youth and having an officer that can form that connection with the youth and uh, form a connection with the state attorney's office, public defender's office, and all those partners that are uh, interplay with our, our delinquent youth. Um, she convinced him to uh, create a juvenile officer position, and um, she was moved into that position uh, from 2004 until pretty much, I believe it was this year, um, or late 2018, she uh, was in that position. She totally became engrossed in all the dealings with the juveniles. Not only did she you know, become aware of the juvenile who were the delinquents, she knew them and their families and the youth who weren't. Uh, and uh, she became very involved and an expert as far as law enforcement. And, and I know that because every time she had a question, she came to me and I told her the answer and she goes back and tells everybody else. She was a fabulous asset to have. Um, she's headed up numerous youth-related communities during her career, boards, networks on St. Lucie County, spanning everything from the runaways to gang members. Uh, she coordinated the Fort Pierce uh, Juvenile Diversion Program for civil citation, which is what we have now, was even uh, talked about. She um, assisted and created the JAM Juvenile Arrest and Monitoring Program, which was very instrumental in bringing some of our more recalcitrant youth, those are the ones who just didn't follow the rules and were out at night causing a lot of trouble. She formed uh, uh, groups that uh, supervised their court orders, made sure they were at home, and uh, when they knew Danny was on the job, they complied a lot more than they did when she was, wasn't. Um, she was also tasked as a juvenile officer, but then a project coordinator for restoring the village. I'll have to say, um, uh, for those of you who don't know, we, we've had a number of, uh, a few years back, we had a really rough time with a, a lot of shootings and murders in St. Lucie County. It got the attention of the, the federal authorities, and, and, and we had a number of grants, and uh, we did um, uh, gratefully begin the restoring uh, the village um, uh, outreach program. And I can tell you over the years, um, you know, we've had less shootings, less murders, and I think it's been a blessing for our community, and Danny formed a part in seeing that that program uh, uh, flourished. Um, she was one of many. <laughs> Many members who I, I spend all the evening talking about how successful the program is because of their contributions, but I just want to let you know that she was instrumental in that, that program as well. And we're not talking about just regular youth that um, don't listen to their parents. We're talking about youth that would easily grab a gun and, and potentially even discharge it. And she, along with the other members of that program, were able to get guns out of the hands of those youth, redirect those youth, and make them more productive members of our society. And as a prosecutor in St. Lucie County that prosecutes every single youth in St. Lucie County, I can tell you that I have fewer youth that w are eligible for that program in my courtroom. I still have some, but the, even the ones I do have, I have them for less and less violations. So that program has been really instrumental in our community and I'm so glad that we have it and have had it. Um, she's an advocate for our area youth. She um, really epitomizes the, the communication that, that law enforcement has with, with my office as a prosecutor. Um, I'm not out there in the communities. I don't know everybody um, out there. Um, I have to trust the information that's given. I make a lot of decisions on pieces of paper that say what youth did and what they didn't do. 
Officer Dry Center was instrumental in, in pointing out which were the important cases, which were the important youth, telling me the good, bad of, of the youth. I mean, just as much as she's pointed out how bad a youth was and how I needed to take extra effort, she pointed out how good they are and how I needed to lighten up. Uh, and um, through those efforts, um, I came to trust her and I made a lot of decisions based on uh, information that was provided. So um, when tasked with deciding who in our community contributed to the rule of law. One of the, that's the first person that I thought of this year um, was Danny Dry Center. I, I couldn't think of anyone else who contributed more to the practice of juvenile delinquency prevention, who assisted me in my prosecutions, who literally would call me the moment a youth was arrested so that I could be properly prepared the next morning. Um, and that was, that's unprecedented um, in my career. And I've been a prosecutor for going on 15 years now, and I worked with Diamond for six and a half years. And um, the, her efforts uh, at um, preventing juvenile delinquency is just unmatched and it's outstanding. And it's with great pleasure that I introduce Danny Dry Center to you. So I don't, I don't know about you all, but I find it very true that the older you get, the more you revert, revert back to you know, your younger self like your childhood. I don't know about you, but in my childhood, I had the attention span of a peanut, all right? I'm there now. And I look around the room and I see a lot of peanuts, okay? So I'm not just gonna keep this short. I wanna thank you, um, you know, for always being there. Um, I'm texting this man like any given day and time. As a matter of fact, I just texted him the other day when I knew he was already at home. I'm like, look, so-and-so was arrested. You gotta be there in the morning, be ready. So um, I want to thank you for your, your dedication as well, um, for having that ear. Um, it's not often that we even get to see some of the attorneys, you know, they check things off their list and away they go. But Carlos actually, you know, takes the time to listen, um, takes every single person for their individual needs, not just point blank, this is the way it's going to go, but their individual needs. So. Thank you for all of that. Thank you for the honor. And let's get to these kids. Like, I'm excited to get to these kids. Let's get to these kids. I don't mind about one thing if I give her a plaque. Everyone gets a plaque here. Uh, for a lifetime of serve, for a lifetime spent in service to the rule of law through devotion to the community and the people, presented to Danny Drysender, Fort Pierce Police Department. Uh, give it on hand the second day of May 2019. Thank All you very right. much. Uh, at this point, um, part two commences and part one concludes. The master of ceremonies is Mr. Carlos Wells. Thank you. pleasure that I get to introduce the, um, uh, one of the honored guests who is going to be um, presenting the awards to the juveniles. It's Dr. Helen Wild, and she's a currently the Assistant Superintendent of Secondary Programs, Non-Traditional Educational Schools here in Port St. Lucie, Florida. She's covering for, she's here for Mr. Wayne Jen, um, who was unable to, our superintendent was unable to be here, um, but I'm proud to um, present her uh, to you. Uh, she's in her fourth year of district leadership with responsibilities including school and principal supervision, reform leadership, labor relations, career technical and virtual programs, policy development, problem solving. Um, it's perfect and very opportune that we have Dr. Uh, Helen Wild here with us. We have um, all the mandates uh, from the uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Act, and then we now have the referendum and some of the, the uh, requirements uh, that the school board is going to, additional resources they're going to have to implement policies and procedures to make education better in St. Lucie County, to make it safer, and also to improve the mental health um, quality in our school system, which I can tell you, um, having uh, for mental health uh, programs for our youth is instrumental. 
I see a number of youth, delinquent youth every day that have mental health issues, and it would be fantastic um, uh, that the school board is uh, uh, assisting us in that process. Uh, Dr. Wild is focused on building effective leadership and systems within the org organization, promoting competence and confidence at all levels, um, and having served at all levels in education from pre-kindergarten to the university level. She's got 25 years experience, including 11 years as a principal, five years as a large A-rated middle school, and six years as the founding principal of Treasure Coast High School. Here she was responsible for overseeing school construction process while creating a vision for breaking uh, rank, smaller learning community high school and with that had 2,600 students. Um, it's uh, with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Helen Wild to you. Good evening everyone. I am thrilled to be here. I know we need to move this ceremony along. Um, on behalf of Superintendent Gent and our wonderful school board, I want to congratulate all of the students that participated in this very challenging contest. And I want to thank the Law Library uh, for sponsoring this contest. And when I looked at the questions that were asked of the students, they were so compelling and thought-provoking and um, would really teach a sense of pride for free speech free press and a free society. So congratulations students. I know this was hard work and you deserve to be recognized. I also want to thank the families for being here tonight and I want to thank everyone in the community for supporting our referendum. Um, as Carlos just mentioned, we are going to be able to do some great things for our students. And I do also see the principal of CAST, of Creative Arts Academy of St. Lucie, Dr. Lori Reed in the audience. I want to recognize her because I know her students are here. And the assistant principal from Palm Point, uh, Miss Annette Newsom, as well as Kate Ems, who is the program specialist for social studies education in St. Lucie Public Schools, and Miss Carrie Patrick, who is our uh, uh, chief communications officer and always a supporter of Law Day. So thank you all for being here, and let's get to the awards. Okay, we're going to start with the K through 2 poster board category. And in third place, we'd like to recognize Jessica Boris from Palm Point. And Jessica wins $50. And we're going to ask the students to... Yeah, $50. the students to stand up here and line up so we can get some great photographs after the event. In second place, we have Liana Bonet, Palm Point. And she wins $75. In first place, winning $100 is Taylor LaPlante from Palm Point Educational Research School. Okay, in the next category, it's the poster board category for third through fifth grade. And in third place, Winning $50 is Olivia Pol Peralta. And in second place, winning $75 is Melania Apostolico. She's expressing her artistic abilities elsewhere, trying out for a play this evening. <laughs> and in first place, winning $100 is Cole Olberg from Christian Lutheran School.
Okay, in the next category, which is the three-dimensional category for sixth through eighth graders, in second place is Kaylee Hunt from Palm Point Educational Research School. And Kaylee is performing tonight, such artistic students. Okay, in first place in this category uh, is Jocelyn Hernandez Gasper. Winning $150. And her principal says she is studying tonight. In the photography contest, in the middle grades, six through eight, in second place is Saya Joseph from Palm Point. Saya receives $100. In first place, in middle school photography, in grades six through eight is Tendra Zawakis. Palm Point winning $150. Tendra gave that wonderful answer when Judge Lynn was speaking earlier this evening. Okay, in first place in the video category for grades six through eight, we have Maria Ramirez Gallego. Maria is receiving $150. Imagine you're in a world in which you can express yourself, in a society in which people judge you the way you are, can dress the manner you wish, or how someone takes your gym away by telling you no. Having a free society is doing what you love, doing what inspires you, showing your art and the way you express it. Let's take this chain off all around the world and let's make a change in society. I don't know about you, but I want to be myself. And she attends the Creative Arts Academy of St. Lucie. I forgot to say her school. And in second place in the video category for grades six through eight, also from Creative Arts Academy, Christian Vasquez. <laughs> Christian receives $100. Congratulations. Imagine a world where you can't speak what you feel and always not being able to stand up for yourself. Always being silent and not being able to tell people to subscribe to PewDiePie. We need freedom of speech. We need it. Congratulations to all of our students, and we're going to get them together for some pictures. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. One last uh, word I want to have is, um, with great gratitude, we have, uh, it's a tradition giving um, uh, speakers um, books, and I wanted to uh, present uh, Mr. Gant through uh, Dr. Uh, Wild, the Gideon's Trumpet. Uh, Gideon's Trumpet is a book by Anthony Lewis describing the story behind Gideon v. Wainwright in which the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that criminal defendants have the right to an attorney even if they cannot afford one. And in 1965, this book won an Edgar Award from the Mystery Writers of America for Best Fat Crime Book. Um, just kind of letting you know, it's really important. Um, criminal law is, as you, as you can see, um, uh, in the topic every day and um, having a strong public defender system as we do here in, in St. Louis County and in Florida is incredibly important and being a former public defender and knowing the struggles that you have to go through through uh, your 
cases, meeting with clients. Um, it's very uh, important that we have a, a very vibrant, strong, and effective public defender system. Um, I'll just share one brief story with you. Um, I had a client, and you know, typical, you know, sometimes you have your stubborn clients, you have your easy clients, and he was a very stubborn client. Um, his case all the way went up to trial. And, um, you know, it's typical, you have your public defender assortment of garb for your clients who don't have any suits. Uh, I had an old suit, and this was an older gentleman who was about my size, and I gave him my suit for the day. Uh, and um, he looked rather sharp in the suit, and um, when he had it all put together, he's like, I'm ready to plead, Mr. Wells. I'm like, what do you mean you're ready to plead? We're here for trial. We picked a jury in the case. And he's like, I'm ready to plead. And, and after talking with him a little further, um, all he wanted was somebody to fight for him and somebody to believe in him. And when he realized that he had that, he was ready to ultimately resolve his case. Uh, and I was glad to be a part of that system. And I'm glad to present Gideon's trumpet to uh, uh, Dr. Hunt for Wayne Gett. Thank you very much for being